Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Larry Cretion, and I'm the director here at the nonprofit Green Energy Consumers Alliance. Um, our mission uh, at the organization is to speed the transition to a low carbon future. And today's webinar is uh, a great example of how we try to achieve our mission. Um, at Green Energy Consumers, we have a few different programs that consumers in Massachusetts and Rhode Island can tap into green energy. Uh, that's our home base. If you're attending today from any other state uh, or nation, we welcome you. Our goal is to provide information and inspiration about today's topic that can be applied to wherever you are. One of our programs uh, that we call Drive Green promotes electric vehicles um, by educating folks uh, about electric cars and helping people get great deals on electric cars through our dealer network. Uh, we've been running Drive Green for four years, and in that time, uh, we've seen extraordinary developments technologically and in the marketplace. The advancements uh, technologically keep coming uh, faster than most people realize. Uh, it's, we look at this every day, and even we're surprised by the pace. Um, and we try to educate people about being aware of the pace um, so that they can move maybe a little faster than they would otherwise. Um, policies to promote the electrification of transportation have uh, been adopted unevenly around the world and here in the United States, even though every climate action study that we've read points to the necessity of phasing out petroleum. Uh, we're getting a little frustrated by all the studies that keep pointing to the same thing, and now we look for action. Um, the question is not whether we will eradicate the internal combustion engine. Uh, the market will take care of that. That will happen eventually, uh, but too late for the planet. So the, qu the key questions we have are, by what date should we eliminate internal combustion engines from being sold? And what mechanisms can we use to accomplish that? Uh, so that's what we're gonna dig into today. One of our guests today will excite us about progress around the world and provide insights into how to get it done. Another guest will describe model legislation that states can adopt to wean off gasoline. We had been talking with her about that legislation and how to file that on the East Coast, uh, when lo and behold, we were thrilled to read in uh, the December 30th, Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan that Governor Baker uh, announced that would piggyback onto California state policy to phase out the sale of new gasoline cars by 2035. We are fortunate enough to have a panelist from the Baker administration who's going to speak about that and explain it to us. And we congratulate him on the new baby. Because over 400 people have registered for this event, you're all muted. We're sure that you have some great questions in store for us and you can ask them using the question function on your screen. We are recording this and we'll be emailing the link out to you soon. Uh, finally, Green Energy Consumers is lucky to have a great electric vehicle program director, Anna Vanderspeck. She's the perfect person to moderate this outstanding panel and Anna, the floor is yours. Thanks, Larry. So as Larry mentioned, uh, my name is Anna Vanderspeck, and I am the Electric Vehicle Program Director at Green Energy Consumers Alliance. And I am really excited and grateful to our all-star panel of experts joining us today from three different time zones to talk to you all about what it means to phase out gas-powered cars. Um, so I'll just run through some quick introductions and then move as quickly as we can to the panelists so that you can hear directly from them. Um, joining us from Amsterdam today, we have Dr. Monica Araya, an international clean mobility advocate, decarbonization strategist, uh, transport lead at Climate Champions, and distinguished fellow at Climate Works. Um, Dr. Araya is well known for her work on electrification. You may have seen some of her really excellent TED Talks. We're really thrilled to hear what her experience and insight can bring to us here in New England. From the West Coast, we're joined by Janelle London, co-executive director of Cultura, which is a nonprofit working to accelerate the transition from gasoline to clean alternatives. Janelle has been leading the Beyond Gasoline initiative in the Silicon Valley with private and public sector partners and has also built and led coalitions to pass electrification measures that we can learn from particularly some in Washington state that she'll tell us more about. And finally, we're joined by Dan Gotti, our Director of Clean Transportation at the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. 
Dan has been instrumental in widening the scope of our state rebate for electric vehicles, more EV, which now covers commercial fleets and medium and heavy duty vehicles. And he'll speak to a lot of work done recently by the Commonwealth to model out how we're going to get from where we are now to net zero emissions by 2050 and what that means for transportation uh, in particular. So phasing out gas-powered cars is a really big topic and something that we could probably spend hours talking about if we allowed ourselves that time. So to focus our conversation today, we've left, uh, sorry, set out five goals that each of our panelists will speak to. So our hope for you as attendees is that by the end of this webinar, you'll have a better understanding of why we need to phase out fossil fuel-powered cars by 2035, why this goal is real, reasonable and feasible, what tools we have at our disposal to make it happen, what exactly needs to happen between now and 2035, and what we still need to learn, what areas we need a little bit more information on to really make this all happen. In terms of structure today, as uh, Larry alluded to, we'll start zoomed out looking at the global picture with Dr. Araya, seeing what's happening internationally on this front. Then we'll move a little closer to home and look at what's happening within the United States with Janelle, with a particular focus on leadership from California and Washington State. And then we'll move in a little bit more and talk about what's happening in Massachusetts with Dan. And I'll speak a little bit to Rhode Island before we move on to Q&A. So this is another um, place to encourage you to put your questions in the chat so that we can get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, and with that, I'll turn it right over to Monica, our first panelist. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you, Larry, for the invitation. I'm very, very happy to be here. I, I lived in the U.S. for eight years, and I'm very excited um, by all the great news we're getting. So let's get started. I am going to tell you a story, which is about this global race to zero emission vehicles, to electric vehicles. So I, I want to do three things. I want to tell you about this campaign, we call it an acceleration campaign, because as Larry said, you know, there is a market and the market will take care of many things, but we need to go faster. That is why we call it a race to zero and a race to zero emission vehicles. And I also want to share with you some of the goals that we have. And if you don't put it into the right context, they may sound like science fiction because people think linear, you know, in linear terms. So I want to emphasize that that change is exponential. And, and I want to, to, to give you an example of how we're dealing with that in our campaign. And then finally, I also want to emphasize one key point, which is that from a climate perspective, we talk about this being the, the critical decade, the decisive decade. And when it comes to electric vehicles, this is even uh, more critical. So the next five years are, are very important for all of us. So I, I really would like you as an audience to, to think about this tomorrow after the webinar and what it means for, for your state, for your city, for your country, for your life, because the next five years will make a big difference and we need all of you in order to, to transform the way we move from A to B. So let's move to the next one. And before I get started, I wanted to share with you that I, I have accumulated quite a few electric kilometers um, I, I've driven electric cars in, in, in several countries, in my own country, Costa Rica, uh, where we have the first electric mobility law in Latin America. Uh, because of personal reasons, my, my, my part of my family, is my husband's family is in Norway, so I have driven there. Now I am in the Netherlands. I have driven in Chile, Mexico, in Oregon. That's where I met Janelle, who is very nice to see her again. Uh, in Poland, in Belarus, that's a very long story, but uh, a few years back, uh, I had to go there for a project with the, the Nordic um, organization in Sweden, Iceland, Belgium, and Scotland. And I want, when I wanted to, what I wanted to capture is that when I go to these places and meet people from consumer alliances, consumer organizations, EV associations, there's this, you know, it doesn't matter we have different passports. It's a very similar sentiment that I, I get from these groups, you know, people that are really committed to, to leaving gasoline and diesel behind 
it's really beautiful and it's very important to keep in mind that even though we need a structural change and we really need to transform the economy we need to engage as people as citizens as consumers so there is no always only the structural or only the personal we really really need both next i also care a lot about trucks and 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 freight so it's really amazing that this is already happening there is this is a, a picture from colombia and um, many people don't know this but even in places like colombia you have you know projects that will electrify uh the deliveries of beer so this is already happening even in in the south sometimes we even though i'll talk a lot about developed countries i wanted to to remind people that this is happening in places like chile places like colombia next and this is oh actually i forgot to mention i have been i was also driving electric in panama um there is the, the lady who you see to to my left is a woman who has trained a lot of electric drive, a lot of uh, buses of electric, uh, sorry, drivers of electric buses in Panama. And it's really endearing to hear her talk about her story and how an electric bus can change her life. Next. And just finally, because I, I need to get into the campaign, I also wanted to mention that I, I live now in Amsterdam and this city is gonna be emissions free by 2030. So you won't see an internal combustion car here after 2030. It's happening, it's hap I see it every, every week, every month. I see more trucks, electric trucks. I see more electric buses. It's very easy to get into an electric car. It's very easy to rent it, even if you don't have a car. Renting one like the blue one is extremely easy. And don't even get me started with started with electric bikes. So it is happening. I know that there are places in the US where this feels distant and it feels like it's gonna happen later in the future, but it is already happening in many, in many places. So this is very good news because we're learning a lot of lessons of what to do and what to do faster and better. Next. So how how do we do this when we think globally? How how do we design a campaign that is about acceleration well um i want to give you an example of something that is underway in the run-up to something called cop 26 this is in the context of a big climate conference that brings 200 countries together and in particular there will be uh this summit in, happening in the uk and therefore they have created a track for you know having this this uh, discussion with key countries from a manufacturing perspective and at the same time, there is something that engages the so-called non-state actors, companies, investors, cities, states. And my job is dealing, it's about dealing with those non-state actors uh, as part of a team called the Climate Champions for COP26. So I lead the transportation team and part of my work is to engage with the UK presidency because they, they have a lot of work to do as government. And, and my job is to bring a lot of the non-state actors uh, around this campaign. So how do we do this? So in the next slide, we'll, we'll walk you the logic of, of how to think about it, because it is, it is, it is important to, to have a structure and to not get overwhelmed by the idea that it's too complicated. It is difficult, but it is, it's not too difficult. You know, this is actually from all the problems that humanity has, this one we can solve. <laughs> um so let's just look at the colors for now if we start from the left and you look at the yellow part of the graph you see that the, the supply side of this right like we have to find a way of getting big manufacturers to agree that after a certain years they will not build the internal combustion engine it is very important to have this in mind because if you look at the the logic of decarbonization in the paris agreement if we have to be net zero by 2050 at the latest and if you do the numbers of how you know the life of a car of a bus of a truck well it's about 10 to 15 years so we have to we have no more decades to think about this you know we have to start somewhere in 2035 and there is part i mean part of the campaign is about dealing with the eco manufacturers and making sure that they start feeling the pressure <laughs> To, to put the date uh, in the public record. And it was very surprising in Europe to hear the news that GM in the US said that after 2035, they will only 
sell electric vehicles. So there are other examples, but the point is that part of the campaign is about the supply side. If you look at the green part of this, it's about demand acceleration, as we call it in the campaign. How do you create more demand? How do you create more momentum so that you show that there is demand in the marketplace? That demand can be divided into two big topics. One is, if you look at the bottom, the fleet owners, because that's where a lot of the scale can be achieved. You know, think about IKEA, you know, think about fleets from governments, fleets from companies. And that is very important to keep in mind because sometimes we get caught up into the idea that if you don't have a car, that's it. I switch to a bike, I walk, I, go, I take the bus, problem solved. And it is true that from a congestion perspective, that is super smart. But from a decarbonization perspective, we still have to figure out how to electrify all those fleets that are, are going to be there for our deliveries, for, for rentals, for tourism. So the demand side is something that I, I work very much with. And if you look at the top, um, you see the word that is very important for this webinar, which is consumers, you know, consumers, EV associations, consumer organizations can have a very important role, will have an important role to play. We have learned from Norway, which is the country that has the, the highest percentage of, of EV sales in the world, in, in new sales. Um, we, we, we have learned there that a consumer tends to convince about two to three people, which is very effective because we know that car dealerships still have some problems with selling EVs. So the role of consumer as an amplifier is key. And a part of our campaign is to activate consumer groups and also, as I mentioned, fleet owners. If you move back to the left and you look at the red boxes, finance is key. I mean, how do you finance the electrification of a fleet for a school, for a, for, you know, a supermarket? How, how do you create opportunities for investments? That's part A. And part B is how do you get, you know, for example, investor platforms to start saying it is risky to have too many assets uh, that are eyes biased because eyes will not have a lot of worth, a lot of you know, value uh, by the end of this decade. So this is already happening. And Morgan Stanley recently put together a report that scared a lot of people because he basically said gasoline is becoming worthless. And then to the, if you move to the right, the blue, the blue area is about the work of policymakers. It can be a region, it can be a state like California, it can be obviously a national government or a city like Amsterdam. And, and part of the COP26 campaign is about making sure that the biggest markets, the governments for bigger, the biggest markets start saying when they are going to make these commitments. And as you can imagine, there are some countries that are not there yet. Uh, next. This is when you see, when I say COP26, that is what I mean, you know, it's the first time that a UN climate conference run by the UK this year is going to have a ZEF angle, a zero emission vehicle angle next. And it, I mean, in the ideal world, you would involve everyone, but for the purpose of the governmental discussion, and this is not part of the UN climate negotiation, this is a campaign that the UK government is leading and, and, and is sectoral and is um, something that is more discretional, they have put together a group of countries. They are bringing them together as part of so something called the ZEF Transition Council. And it basically invites the countries that have large manufacturing bases and some friendly countries that are smaller, like, like for example, Norway, um, and then, you know, you have this constellation of countries and the idea is to find ways of accelerating the shift. Not all of them have dates, but the ones that have a green star have already set out a date for, for phasing out uh, ice, you know, the ice, the ice cars, the ones in red don't have a date yet. But what I wanted to capture here is the fact that this is taking place in that in the past, is this was created last year, um, the involvement came through California and now the US is very likely to join. There are conversations about China joining and Germany joining. So 
this is extremely exciting because this, this had, ne had never happened. Let's move to the next one. So my job is about something called race to zero. And I really, really would like to capture that race to zero is about two things. It's a race, you know, it's not a walk around the park. So we are in a hurry and it's to zero. So we're not talking about hybrids. We're not talking about efficient cars that are efficient in burning fossil fuels. It's about zero emission, a zero emission transformation. Next. So this, this race to zero has many elements. It's not just about the cars and vehicles, and it's, it, it's also about other sectors. But what I wanted to capture here is that next month, we'll have a ZEF, a zero emission vehicle ambition platform, and it will show the commitments according to you know, the, the image I had before, it supply, demand, finance, and policy. Next. And then, Another insight, I'll go here very quickly, is that change is not linear, it's exponential. So what happened in 20, 20, 2019 is not a good reference for what will happen in 2022. So when you hear analysts that say, oh, but you know, EVs are only a, a small percentage of the market, you know, they are tiny and insignificant. They are missing the point that we have to look at the growth rates and the growth rates will be exponential. So if, if you say the growth rate now is 2%, well, it will go from two to four to four, from four to eight, from eight to 16, as opposed to 2% every single year in a linear way. So we'll see just a very quick summer, visual summary next. Um, basically, this is what we are advocating, you know, 100% zero emission vehicle sales by 2035, 2030 for buses, because buses are going much faster than anybody imagined and 2040 for trucks. And I know that for some people, this is, uh, you know, as I said before, it may sound like science fiction, they just cannot believe this is possible. But if you, if you move to the next, what I wanted to capture there is that we have to think differently about this and we have to look at what technology has done in the past, for example, with solar. And we know that first there is acceleration, then transformation, and then the technology is normalized. So that's what we call a race to zero. You know, eventually we will get there, but we really have to pay attention to the next five years next. And we can skip, we can skip because uh, we're, I, I want to make sure I have something to say about that during the call. So next, the next five, the, the next five years are critical for EVs for a number of reasons. And this is going to be my last point next. Why are the next five years so important? Well, because of two things, many things, but two that I want to I want to leave you with. One is the, one is the economics of this. You know, the technologies are getting cheaper and they are getting better, and we're going to get price parity by the mid 20s. This is super important because that means that the price of a nice car is going to be competitive. I mean, sorry, the, pri the price of an EV will be competitive with the price of, of a nice car. And this is gonna start happening for most segments by the mid twenties. There will be investment opportunities. We see them now around batteries, green bonds, EV infrastructure. So new stakeholders are coming to this with a very strong mindset of opportunity and investment opportunity. And this is good because we need capital and too much capital is still going to the fossil fuel industry. So having capital coming to this is critical and at the same time it's very important to flag that some traditional analysts are starting to flag in investment language that the internal combustion engine is the next coal that's why we talk about ice phase outs in the past we used to talk about coal phase outs so so this is starting to 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 knock at the door of investors and this is very powerful in addition to the, the, the changes in the economy and, and the economic framing of this, the politics is very, you know, this is also very important because the environmental justice part of this is also kicking in. It's unacceptable that we have diesel truck pollution affecting people that are already hurt by other, other realities of our society. So diesel pollution and, and gasoline pollution hurts everyone, but it hurts minorities and low-income communities disproportionately. So this is already 
very big. And then the just transition is also there. You know, we know that a lot of organized unions have problems with this transition, but they are getting, some of them are getting to see the opportunities because they don't want to be left behind. And finally, and Janelle will talk about this, is, is this cultural shift is already becoming bigger and, and more uh, transformational, you know, our relationship to polluting cars, to fossil fuels. So the bigger point is that, yes, we have opposition. Yes, we have resistance to change and a lot of myths that are very uh, annoying. <laughs> but uh, it is my belief that we can overcome the remaining barriers in the next five years. So this transition is within reach. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Monica, for that tour de force through the, the global picture. And at this point, I will shift the slides over and welcome Janelle up um, to speak a little bit more about the US. Hi, thank you very much for having me today. And Monica, that was an amazing talk. I loved it. I was with you every step of the way. Thanks for that. Um, so Monica's teed up very nicely uh, what I'm going to talk about now, uh, starting with the big picture, which Monica already laid out. Um, you can see that there, th this is a, a similar slide to what she showed, but it's kind of the years in which uh, countries have announced plans to phase out gas powered cars. And you can see that there's a lot of, a lot of countries here on this map and that mostly the, the time frame is 2030 to 2040. Um, so it's pretty exciting to see what's happening. Um, an annoying thing is that um, in the U.S. there's a lot of gray where there's no commitments yet and we haven't committed as a country. Um, but let's break down what, what is happening in the U.S. Okay, so it's a pretty exciting time to be in the U.S. because we actually have a lot of momentum growing for phasing out gas-powered cars. So all the states you see here with, with years by them have made some sort of announcement in terms of either um, a, a, an executive order or um, a, a bill has been introduced or there's a plan by the administration that includes uh, phasing out sales of new gas powered cars by the years you see here. And this doesn't look like a, you know, it's not a ton of states, but I will say that when you think about other um, big political movements and social movements like marriage equality, these tend to be kind of the exact same states that went first um, along the coasts. And so uh, we're very encouraged by the fact that this is happening and, and it looks like we're heading definitely in the right direction. So some momentum is building. Next slide, please. All right, so what, who are kind of the leaders and what's happening? So California, um, you guys may have heard about this and just in case I'm gonna kind of go through it, but California um, it, it, last year, Governor Newsom, made a, an announcement that he was issuing an executive order. And the order is not a final rule. I think it's important to note that, that it is, uh, it's an order for the California Air Resources Board to make rules that will require automakers to, probably it's gonna require automakers to um, sell an increasing percent of electric vehicles until we reach 100% of all new vehicles being um, zero emission vehicles by 2035. Um, this, so, so that sounds pretty great. And I think it's been portrayed in the news as, Hey, California is phasing out sales of new gas cars by 2035, but we're, we're not quite there. And we've got uh, a bit of a road to, to go. Um, so first the air resources board has to actually come up with these rules and it's in the process of doing that now, but it is going to probably take a while. And you can be sure that there's going to be a lot of stakeholders arguing and, and giving input about how this ought to be done. And it's going to take some time to figure out exactly what these rules will look like. Um, just to back up a little, I'll say that um, just, I don't know, in case you guys are not familiar with how the law works, you're going to be great at cocktail parties after you hear this, because I'm going to just give you a super quick rundown of something called federal preemption and how it is that California even has the authority to do this. So, um, and I'm assuming that there's some, some knowledge here, but I'll just give you the basic background. Okay, so the federal government has a couple of laws and, and they govern vehicle emissions and fuel economy standards. And so uh, the way the US works where there are federal laws occupying a field, um, a state law cannot have a conflicting, it cannot be conflicting with those federal laws. So that's called federal preemption. If the federal law occupies the field, 
it preempts state laws from making it states from making laws about that sort of thing. In terms of California, California alone has a special exception that it alone can make vehicle emissions set vehicle emissions standards that are stricter than those of the federal government. And there's another rule in, 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 on the books that says that if California does make a law like that, other states can follow those laws provided that they do it exactly the way California has done it. And so California has been a leader in this way, setting these vehicle emission standards that are requiring um, automakers to sell an increasing percent of, of zero emission vehicles. And so this started in, um, I think, 2012, um, that California started making these rules and other states started joining in little by little. So right now, there are 12 states that follow California's requirements. And Virginia just announced or just passed a law saying that it's going to become the 13th. Um, up till now, the, the way that this California rule works is up till 2025, um, automakers have to earn credits by selling an increasing percent of electric or zero emission vehicles. And the way the credit system works, it, co it amounts to about 8% of, of their vehicles have to be zero emission by 2025. So um, what we're talking about for this 2035 phase out is taking that ramp that goes up till right now, it's about two and a half percent that automakers have to sell their electric vehicles. It goes from two and a half percent up to about 8% by 2025. And what we're talking about now is what that ramp will look like past 2025, going all the way up to zero by 2035. Um, the 12 states that have adopted California's rules can then follow California up to this total of 100% ZEVs by 2035. Okay, so that was a little detour. Um, going back to how this will happen. So the Air, Air Resources Board has to create the rules around this. And then uh, there's absolutely no doubt that there will be court challenges, um, both under California and federal law. Um, so again, by way of background, California's authority to do this, to, to pass these uh, vehicle emission standards that are stricter than the feds, was challenged by the prior administration. In fact, it, the, the prior administration revoked that authority. Um, and then immediately there was a lawsuit saying, hey, um, you know, federal government, you don't have the ability, you can't, you can't revoke this authority. California's authority cannot be revoked. And so there's litigation pending about that. Um, once the Biden administration came in, um, it said, hey, you know, actually let's, we don't need to fight about this. And so currently that litigation is in abeyance, meaning it's not, it's not moving forward. And so there's kind of, it's just kind of hanging there. Um, but, you know, the prior administration claimed to have revoked this authority. So there's going to be a lot of issues around that sort of thing. And, you know, has the authority been revoked? Can California keep moving forward to this 2035 100% um, goal? Um, so assuming all that works out and whenever it all works out, which it may take, it may take a while, um, then the way the law works is whatever final rule California does come up with, that has to get a waiver from the federal EPA. Um, this is a system that's been around for a long time. California has sought waivers and always received them. Um, if it had, it depends which administration is in place. So if we have kind of uh, another uh, like Trump 2024, um, there may, and that's exactly when this is happening, the EPA might not issue the waiver. Okay, I know that's a lot of legal stuff, but it's important to know. Okay, so the task ahead for the California Air Resources Board is to define what is, how are we going to get to this 100% ZEV sales? Um, and so this is a, a interpretation from the Union of Concerned Scientists of what the curve might look like. It hasn't been developed yet. We don't know what it's going to be, but it will be this requirement for an increasing percent that automakers are on point to, to uh, put in the dealerships of their vehicles. And so um, you can see here that th this would be a pretty steep curve after maybe 2022 or 2023. Um, and, and then we'd have to you know, really ramp it up to get to 2035 to get to 100%. Um, so that's, that is still being worked out how that will look. This may not be the end curve. It may be a different curve. You know, with, with enough pressure, it might be a curve to get to maybe 
um, really close to 100% by even earlier, maybe 2030. Uh, one thing California needs to look at is, you know, it's got this trail of 12 or 13 other states that are following its lead. And so it has to try to figure out politically what's palatable to let California move and bring everyone along without being so uh, drastic that maybe it's, it becomes challenging for those states. Next slide, please. So um, my nonprofit, Cultura, leads a coalition in Washington state, and we're doing something a little bit different. Um, so I told you about the legal path that California has to bring along other states in requiring automakers to sell an increasing percent of zero emission vehicles. Uh, we have identified and we published a law review article about another legal path. And the idea would be that um, states uh, have authority to do things that are within their state jurisdiction. And there's a lot of reasons to require an electrified fleet of vehicles that have nothing to do with the two areas that are preempted by, by federal law. Remember, those two areas are vehicle emissions and fuel economy. But there's a lot of reasons to want an all EV, all EVs in your state uh, that have nothing to do with that. So for instance, um, creating jobs, saving consumers money, um, preventing those motor oil, the, the leaks and spills of motor oil and gasoline that get washed into waterways, and especially in Washington state, harm the orcas and salmon that rely on clean water. Um, there are issues around grid stability. If you have all EVs, you have a lot better chance of really stabilizing your grid, especially as we're starting to see two-way charging um, or vehicle to grid integration where these vehicles are basically batteries on wheels and and they can take energy from the grid but they can also give energy back to the grid when that's needed so there are a lot of purely state reasons well within the state's authorization to to require this and so proceeding along that path washington has decided oh sorry back up please uh, prior slide thanks so Washington has introduced a bill that says that starting in 2030, so not 2035, but in 2030, all new cars have to be electric vehicles for the reasons that I just told you about that are solely state reasons. You will not see any mention of emissions or fuel economy at all in this bill. And in you know, 2029 and earlier, gas cars are okay. Next slide, please. So we did some polling as there, and, and as Monica mentioned, there is, really we're gaining political support. There's a real movement around wanting this. So we did this polling and 59% of voters in Washington supported the idea that there would be no new gas car sales after 2030, that all new cars would have to be electric. Next slide, please. And this, we were surprised to find that this support really crossed party lines. Um, there was amazing amount of support at all in, in all political parties. Next slide, please. So for Washington, the thought is, why wait? We can actually get this done by 2030. We already have the technology. Automakers are, are all announcing that they're starting to sell electric vehicles. Um, Washington state in particular has a lot of hydroelectric power. Um, it, has, it has abundant sun, uh, solar and wind power, so we'd be getting this uh, energy from, from renewables. Um, that has some of the, the most expensive gasoline prices and cheapest electric prices in the country. So it's really Washington is very well suited to move ahead and not, not have to wait until 2035. And so, um, you know, Washington is, a, is a, one of the states that follows California. So it has, now it has two, two tracks possibly, um, uh, the track of following California to 2035, if that happens, if that works out. But if not, and, and even or if so, it also has a faster track. So again, this is the slide showing the California path. Um, but you know, Washington could back that up by five years, and that that's an enormous deal. So uh, so um, I'm going to tell you about that in just a second. But I want to let you know the status of this bill. So it is it, it um, was introduced in both houses in Washington State. Um, with large groups of co-sponsors, more than a dozen co-sponsors on each side. Um, and literally this week, it passed its first committee. So it was introduced in the House, the Washington State House, 
and it passed the House Transportation Committee. So um, that's a real milestone. It's the first time anywhere in the US that a legislature has said, hey, we wanna, we wanna end the use of gas powered vehicles in the sale of new gas powered vehicles. Um, <clears throat> as happens in the sausage making that is the, <laughs> the political process, um, the bill was in, in that first um, committee, it was amended and it was amended from a mandate, you know, requiring that new sales be electric to a goal. And we were disappointed about that, of course, but I'll tell you, it's still really significant for, for a few reasons. So first, um, it, it, um, it's really specific about what the policy is and what has to happen with it. And it's really easy for the public to understand. It's, it's not like a greenhouse gas reduction goal where who knows how many millions of tons things are and what it takes to cut them. It, it's really the first time that an elected body in the US has set a goal for phasing out gas cars. Um, and this is also, even though it's not a mandate, it still sends a signal to industry that the government is getting behind this goal and that you know more regulation is likely to follow. Um, and you know these European goals, there have been a lot of in Europe that were also for 2030, and and many of them are just goals. But they've actually pushed the auto industry forward a lot, and and this will do the same thing. Um, another great thing about this bill is that it's pressure. It's going to pressure California to push its 2035 gas car phase out date to earlier. California would hate to become number two as opposed to the leader. You know California considers itself the leader in this and really has been, um, but here's Washington kind of one up in California, that's gonna create a lot of pressure. Um, and at, at the very least, it'll make this curve that we're seeing here possibly steeper um, so that we get to more, closer to 100% faster than 2030, 20, than faster than 2035. Um, also, it's really a starting point for more legislation in the future. So if this bill passes, and we pray that it does, um, it's really gonna make it easier to pass legislation that works further towards this goal without having to go back and debate the timeline. Um, and then finally, I'll tell you that this bill has gotten a lot of media coverage, and it's really helping bring the public along with the idea that this is, that is, this is possible, that 2030 could be possible, and just generating more and more public support for this idea. Um, so we, we're super excited about this bill. Um, next step is the House Rules Committee, and then it goes to the full House floor. Um, then the Senate, Senate side bill comes along as well, and we're, we'll be keeping you guys updated if you want to. Um, anyway, you should track this thing. It's, it's, uh, we're, we're kind of 24 seven thinking about it and, and really excited and pushing it forward. We have an amazing coalition of groups uh, that are supporting this bill and more are joining all the time. All right, thank you very much for a chance to present today. Thank you very much, Jamel, for bringing that um, experience and insight from the West Coast over to the East. Um, I'll now ask Dan um, to come on to talk to us a little bit about what's going on in Massachusetts. Hey everybody, and thanks to uh, my fellow panelists uh, for what's been a great conversation so far. My name is uh, Daniel Gotti. I'm Director of Clean Transportation Policy at the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. As many of you know, I'm taking a little time out of my paternity leave to be to join you all today. I have to admit, I'm a little sleep deprived, um, but I'm always fired up to talk about EVs, um, especially to a group like Green Energy Consumers Alliance. Um, you know, I believe that the Drive Green program that you guys have put together over the past few years is one of the best programs in the country and making it simple and easy to purchase an EV. And I think we in state government have a lot to learn from your experience as we consider how to expand our programs to reach more consumers. Let me start by saying a few things about EVs and their place in the broader context of Massachusetts climate policy before I get to some of the things that we're doing now to help make the transition to EVs happen. Massachusetts' signature climate law is called the Global Warming Solutions Act, and it requires the state, state to set and achieve mandatory limits on total global, global warming emissions. Last year, Governor Make, ba Baker made Massachusetts one of the first states in the country to set a limit of net zero emissions by 2050. Now, 2050, let me tell you, is not that far away. My son is currently seven days old, and in 2050, he's gonna be 29. Uh, so we have just one generation now uh, to get this right. 
Uh, one of the responsibilities of the Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs is to come up with a plan to achieve the limits required by the GWSA. This is not a small task. It requires nothing less than for us to think about every part of our economy, to look at every way our society uses fossil fuels and to find zero emission solutions. Over the past few years, EEA has been studying every aspect of this issue, and we put some of our conclusions together in two reports that we released in December of last year. One of these reports, the Interim Clean Energy and Climate Plan, or CECP, fulfills our statutory obligation to update the GWSA by setting our overall emissions limit for 2030 and presenting our plan to achieve that limit. Our interim CECP calls for a reduction requirement of at least 45% of 1990 levels by 2030. This figure is currently, as many of you from Massachusetts will know, is the subject of negotiations with the legislature who would like us to actually increase this requirement. But even at 45%, our plan would represent the most aggressive emissions requirement in operation in the United States today. In addition, EEA also released our deep decarbonization pathways analysis, which demonstrates how the plan to cut emissions over the next 10 years fits into the broader plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. One conclusion from this analysis is that if we're going to achieve the limits required by the science and by the laws of the Commonwealth, we cannot continue to sell passenger vehicles powered by gasoline. That's why our CECP calls for vehicle emission standards that will ensure that by 2035, all new vehicles sold in Massachusetts will be zero emission vehicles. This is consistent with the recent executive order by Governor Newsom of California, and we appreciate the leadership that California continues to show on this issue and the unique role that they play under the Clean Air Act. And I would like to thank Janelle for covering this in some detail so that I don't have to right now uh, in terms of the legal status. Um, we're also happy to see that New Jersey has also called uh, joined the call for 100% zero emission vehicles by 2035. I expect a lot more states are going to do this in the relatively near future. We're all looking at the same data here. We're all looking at the same kind of modeling. Um, you know, what, with the emissions requirements that a number of states have committed to, um, I, I think a 2035 zero emission goal is, is going to become part of a lot of our climate plans. You know, on the one hand, achieving 100% new vehicle sales by 2035 is an audacious goal. Um, EVs currently represent less than 5% of new vehicle sales in Massachusetts. Even in California, EV sales represent only about 8% of new vehicle sales right now. But there's no serious question that this goal is technically achievable. I'm sure many of you saw that last month General Motors announced that they too are planning for all new vehicles sold by GM to be zero emission by 2035. Ford has followed with their own ambitious announcement on EVs. And I have to say, as somebody who's worked in this policy area now for over a decade, you know, that moment of, of seeing General Motors uh, make that commitment. Um, and, you know, I know that when it comes to, to the OEMs, you know, we, we have to take an approach of, of trust but verify or, or, or maybe trust but regulate. Um, but, but still, it's an extraordinary moment to see um, our leading auto manufacturers who have fought uh, strong standards for so long. Um, now embracing an all-electric future. The reason that we here at EEA and why so many people within the auto industry are confident that the future of transportation is electric is because of one simple fact. The vehicles are better. The electric motor is simpler, it's more efficient, it's more powerful, it has fewer moving parts, it doesn't require the use of a complex transmission, and it produces no direct emissions and therefore has no need of an exhaust system or a tailpipe. It's a better mousetrap. And if any of you on this call doubt that today's electric vehicles provide a superior consumer performance, I encourage you to spend five minutes driving one. The motor is smooth and quiet. The acceleration is fantastic. It's a lot of fun to drive and it's more convenient to own than you might expect. And let me just say, if there are may maybe some others of you who have been thinking about an EV purchase, but worry about whether the range and the charging infrastructure is sufficient, give it a try. Um, I think that you'll find that it's a lot more convenient for your lifestyle than, than maybe you might, might realize. While the future of EVs is bright, EVs face significant limitations in the short and medium term. EVs are already cost effective from a total cost of ownership perspective, um, thanks to reduced fueling and maintenance costs, but the upfront cost of an EV is still too expensive for many middle-class or working-class families. The infrastructure to support EVs is still limited. 
We've had over 100 years and billions of dollars in public subsidies to build the distribution network that we need to support gasoline vehicles. Building out the infrastructure to support vehicle electrification is going to take time and continued investment. That's why we're working hard to develop policies and programs that will remove these barriers and bring the benefits of EV ownership to more Massachusetts residents. Three things that we've rolled out in just the past couple of months demonstrate this administration's commitment to a future of electric transportation. Last week, we announced our first incentive program to uh, encourage the electrification of medium and heavy duty vehicles, MOR EV truck. With the rise of e-commerce, delivery trucks have been a growing source of congestion and emissions in our urban areas. And the COVID crisis has only accelerated the critical role played by last mile delivery services. Urban delivery trucks are diesel vehicles that operate within residential areas. The diesel engines powering these vehicles produce significant quantities of both PM 2.5 and nitrous oxide, both of which have been tied to adverse COVID outcomes. Disproportionately, delivery trucks are housed and operate within environmental justice communities. Delivery trucks are also centrally fueled vehicles that operate on predictable routes well within the range of existing battery capacity and vehicle technology. And the market for deliv electric delivery trucks is already achieving scale in Europe and Asia. MOR EV truck will provide significant incentives to help develop the market for electric trucks and make Massachusetts a leader in this important technology. Our program will also provide an additional incentive for trucks that operate within environmental justice communities to ensure that the benefits of improved air quality go to the communities that need it the most. In addition, last month, the Department of Environmental Protection announced a new initiative to help install publicly accessible DC fast chargers, along with a revamped program to encourage apartment buildings to, to install charging stations. These investments will make it easier for tenants and Massachusetts residents who do not have access to off-street parking to make the jump to an electric vehicle. In addition, Massachusetts is working with the other states of the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic region to create the first regional limits on transportation pollution through the Transportation and Climate Initiative. In December, Massachusetts joined Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Washington, D.C. as the first jurisdiction to, to support uh, a cap and invest program modeled after the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. The Memorandum of Understanding between the states calls for a program that would cut emissions from gasoline and diesel fuel by 26% by 2032. In addition to creating the first enforceable limits on transportation pollution in the region, this program would provide a funding stream for Massachusetts and other jurisdictions to invest in transportation solutions. We estimate that the program could provide up to $300 million every year for clean transportation projects. The Memorandum of Understanding specifies that a minimum of 35% of program funds, or more than $100 million per year, shall be used to benefit overburdened and underserved environmental justice communities. This is an important opportunity for all of us to think creatively about how we can use new sources of funding to cut emissions, improve public health, and expand mobility options for the communities that need clean transportation the most. We look forward to, to continued engagement with Green Energy Consumers Alliance and with all of you as we think about how we make the transition to EVs happen here in Massachusetts. And we're really excited to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, for that context um, and for your leadership on all this within the state. Um, I'm suddenly getting an echo. I will take a moment to try and address that. Can you all hear me? I'm going to assume that you can hear me <laughs> and just keep going. Um, so um, I will take a moment to talk about some legislation that has been filed in support of what the goal in the Clean Energy and Climate Plan is, um, which you may not have heard yet because it is very recent. Um, so Representative Joan Moschino just filed an act relative to an electric transportation future. Um, and this act is very short. The full text is on the screen. Um, and basically what it does is it gives us another lever to push for the same phase out of 2035 in Massachusetts. Um, so if you read the text of the bill, it says that the Registrar of Motor Vehicles will not accept applications for original registration for any light duty vehicle as long, uh, unless that vehicle is an electric vehicle starting on January 1st, 2035. 
So what this means um, is specifically that only battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids or uh, fuel cell, electric fuel cell vehicles will be able to be registered starting in 2035 um, if, this, if this bill gets through. So it was just filed, we're at the very beginning of this process, but what we see this as is effectively a, a, a backstop um, that in the event that the California process and the waiver and all those lawsuits drag everything out, we have this, it's another avenue that we can pursue to, to reach the same end goal. And then before we turn to a Q&A session, um, I want to just mention that Rhode Island is thinking about this too. Um, as an organization that works in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island, um, we would be amiss if we didn't mention Rhode Island as well. So Rhode Island has a mobility innovation working group that recently um, released a report after studying transportation issues in the state for quite some time. Um, and in that report, they actually had a recommendation to stop or sorry, only sell EVs starting in 2040. So the actual text of that recommendation is in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, and what you can see is that they explicitly call out the leadership of Massachusetts and California um, as a reason why this is something that Rhode Island should also be thinking about. So this is a, a very clear example of how leadership from states like California and Massachusetts is normalizing the idea of phasing out gas-powered cars um, across the country. So with that, I will ask all of our panelists to return. I'll stop sharing my screen um, and we'll get to some of the many, many questions that have been put into the chat. Um, one thing I should mention is that it is almost one o'clock, at least Eastern time, um, but we will keep going. Um, we have another half hour of time if we have enough questions and want to use it. So um, please do hang on if you can. Um, so thank you, panelists, for coming back. Um, the first question that I want to ask is um, for Monica. You mentioned Norway, um, and we had some questions in the chat about what what can we learn from Norway, particularly what can we learn in terms of dealers in Norway. We are struggling here with um, car dealers um, who don't really want to sell EVs yet at the rate that we need them to. So what can we learn from Norway to help out our car dealers? in the States. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very important name in the story and often it's told very simplistically because you've probably heard, you know, it's an oil country, it has a lot of money and it has given a lot of incentives. Uh, it's not applicable to the rest of the world. You know, that, that's, I, I've heard that many times. So it's, it's important to, to get the story right because what they have done is, is not necessarily that they give us, you know, um, you know, that they give money away to the consumer. What they have done is is a very smart signaling uh, policy that basically makes what is polluting extremely expensive and what is zero emissions extremely well, not extremely cheap, but uh, you know, it, you reach price parity before the market gets there. So, for example, if you take and a gold, right? Like you take an electric gold versus a diesel gold or a diesel, you know, gasoline powered gold, you know, for, from Volkswagen. When, when you look at why the consumer enters the shop and sees an electric car that is that has a more attractive price than the, the, the gasoline version is because they have something called a CO2 tax and they make that car more expensive, the, the gasoline car more expensive and they take away the taxes from the electric car. So some sale taxes, some extra taxes that you would pay normally. So, so it's, it's a very interesting uh, achievement because it basically says to society, if you want to, if you really, really want to buy an, a nice car, if you're really dying to have this polluting car for whatever reason, well, you're gonna have to pay a lot of money for it. So for example, if you go to Norway, try buy a big SUV. <laughs> you, you really have to have a lot of money to, to buy that because they, they, there is a green tax, right? So that part of the story is rarely told because it's, it's, it's as I said, the lazy story is that it's just an, a subsidy that the consumer gets. The other thing that is very important to keep in mind about Norway is that there is, because there is a green tax, the, the gasoline is extremely expensive. So when you as a consumer do the math, and consumers do the math, believe me, my mother-in-law did the math, <laughs> it's, 
the, the advantages for you on a monthly basis are so attractive that it's it's a no-brainer. So so that is also quite important. Another element of the of the Norwegian story that is very beautiful is that the, the Norwegian EV Association is the largest in the world. So it has 80,000 members, very active, bottom up organization. They do a lot of the hearts and minds. They are the ones, you know, just I'm telling you because I know the the, the woman who lives there, and I think Janelle you know, met her um, too, our dear friend Christina, Christina Boo. And the stories are very powerful because there is nothing like uh, a sister talking to a sister, a neighbor talking to a neighbor, you know, the, the, the skeptical uncle that really doesn't want to, to change. But then you have a neighbor that comes to you and say, drive it, just as Dan said, if you have doubts, drive it, you know. And because they have a lot of snow and a lot of mountains, you know, it's very important for them to get the infrastructure right. And, and the other thing they have done is that um, the model for investment is very business friendly. So there is a lot of infrastructure. So, so there are many elements to that. And, and I think what is very important to, to highlight is that where I see a, the big barrier in, in other countries, it, of course, is the price. But let's just say, you know, price parity hit and, and to some degree, it, it's just already happening in key markets. But I do see a problem with the car dealers. Um, I'll stop here, but I can tell you many horror stories from other markets where you actually have a family coming and saying, I want to buy an EV. And you have that car dealer saying, no, you don't want an EV. <laughs> you want the SUV. <laughs> and, and let me just buy it. Let me just tell you why. You know. So I know you guys have done work in that space. But, but I think if we separate the price signal, which is there from the problem we have the, from car dealers, I find that that there is where we, we have a lot of innovation um, to, to do because I know this is a problem in the US in particular. I, I kind of have two questions that I want to take in, in two different directions and I'll, I'll ask one clarifying question for Janelle first and then come back to a, a larger question raised by your response, Monica. So Janelle, one clarifying question for you from the audience is how exactly d does the, the ZEV system right now force dealers to sell electric vehicles? Uh, so it's a credit system. And uh, dealers, uh, it's not the dealers, it's the automakers. They have to supply these vehicles. And um, if they don't, they have to, if they don't get enough credits, they have to buy the credits from another auto automaker. Um, and so one comes to mind who probably has an excess of credits and that's Tesla. Um, and so there's a lot of, of purchasing of credits. Um, so that's it, it's a credit system. Yeah, and I did just want to mention one thing just in response to Monica. Monica, you might be surprised that for the Washington bill, the Washington Auto Dealers Association just endorsed it. So auto dealers in Washington are, I think, recognizing that this is coming and they might as well embrace it. Can you talk about that a little bit more? What what got them to the table? Why? why, why? <laughs> yeah, uh, we literally got the endorsement yesterday and we are also scratching our heads. So um, stay tuned. We are gonna dig into that. <laughs> Well, it's a good sign. I think it speaks to the fact that the those graphs of adoption not being linear but exponential, we're not the only ones who are seeing those graphs and, and thinking about what they mean for the future. Um, I'd like to come back to one thing that you, oh, sorry, go ahead, Monica. Just a very quick point about about my experience in, in Costa Rica, because it's a small market, but because all the electricity is, is renewable already makes a lot, it's a country where it makes sense to just go electric, right? So one observation I have is that it also depends on the on the brand and the car dealer. For example, um, there is a big difference between a country, a company that wants to sell a hybrid versus one that has a zero, you know, zero emission model, uh, a, a tailpipe free car that is dying to sell. So, so I I agree with you that in the last year I st start to see some of them coming around and saying, well, we might as well, you know go with the flow and, and, and advertisement more. So it's there are some good news too. Okay. 
I'll bounce to you, Dan, with a question I, that's been phrased a couple of different ways, which is basically, do we have enough electricity for all of these cars? And I know that um, the Commonwealth has spent a lot of time thinking about that um, with a very long transportation appendix and the whole roadmap. So um, if you don't mind responding to that. Right there, I'm unmuted. Okay, yeah, no, I mean, um, and and you know, uh, I'm I'm definitely the transportation person uh, within EEA, um, and we definitely we have a lot of people thinking really carefully about uh, what what this means for the grid. I mean, I think one one um, good piece, one thing that's very much good news about uh, the transition to electric vehicles is that we're already seeing the vast majority of EV charging is going to occur overnight. Um, which for, from a grid management perspective, you know, is the time that you have the most spare capacity. Um, I think particularly as we think about, you know, Massachusetts moving towards a future in which hydro and offshore wind probably is the combination that um, is going to provide a, a great deal of our electricity mix. Um, you know, I think we're going to end up seeing some, some uh, Real potential to take advantage of spare capacity overnight um, to, to to be able to to do that, and of course we're not just adding the transportation uh, energy into our electric grid; we're also adding thermal um, heating to it as well. Um, so so it is a big challenge. Um, it's going to require uh, a really modern grid that is capable of doing more complex things than our grid is doing right now. Um, we have right now in Massachusetts an open um, grid modernization docket, um, 2069. Uh, we uh, there have been a number of things that are already there that are already part of the conversation, inclu including things like moving to to time of use rates um, to to help manage uh, the transition to EVs. Um, but you know, I I think that's that's going to become an increasing focus uh, for for us a, a, as we think about it. And you know, for those of you who do have EVs on this call, and I'm I'm sure that there are quite a few, um, you know, thinking about you know when are you charging? Um, you know, can you enroll both National Grid and EverSource um, have programs that provide consumers with some incentives for um, allowing the utility to kind of manage your charging a little bit? Um, which I, I think can be really helpful um, in, in, in thinking about the future. In the long run, you know, the transition to EVs should be good for ratepayers. It should, it should have an effect of lowering electric rates. Um, and that, that can be one of the really exciting um, uh, parts of, of making this work and, and can be a, a really good source of growth for, for our economy. Janelle or Monica, does either of you want to speak to that question on a a non New England specific way? If not, I have tons of other questions that I can go through. Okay. Um, so, Monica, hearing you talk about what's going on in Norway with the just make things that are not so good, very expensive, so that, and simultaneously bring down the cost of the things that are have these societal benefits to sort of even out the playing field, um, I'm sure that to an American audience that sounds a little intimidating. Um, and I know that one sort of bucket of questions that's coming in is about costs. Um, so I'm wondering, and this is a question I'd actually love each of you to respond to if you'd like, is how are you thinking about costs? Are you concerned that setting this goal, putting these things in play will increase costs for drivers and particularly, I know Monica, you called out the environmental justice piece of all of this um, with diesel trucks, but also gasoline is a, is a huge public health hazard. How are you balancing thinking about those two things as, as we're looking at this ramp up? Monica, I, I can also unmute too. you. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So okay. So there was there is a lot there, and and I think there are different levels, right? Like, what is the cost for society? What is the cost for a city? What is the cost for a person? You know, what is the cost for the neighbor? So so there you know there are different ways of, of tackling this. I think from from a you know structurally speaking, we can show with numbers that it is better for a city and for a country for example like a country like costa rica to to electrify than to continue where with, with the status quo because of the pollution because in our case we have to import a lot of the oil and because you know the noise uh, you know you can you if you look at the numbers you can make a case for the person that wants to listen 
obviously if you don't want to listen you will find a way of always being skeptical so 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 at that level you know we will need to have scientists and doctors and others joining so that it's not just oh but what is the cost of the price you know what is the the, the the price of this car and is, are, is, is this only for the wealthy because this is obviously a, a, a question that comes up a lot if you look again if you look at the transition and if you think about a sequence right or you don't have to do everything at the same time it's very important that we create acceleration through fleets because the total cost of ownership is is the key to a lot of this if you just look at an at one case you know one neighbor and you put a very dramatic case you know i've been in situations where you almost have to apologize for for promoting it is because it's, it sounds disconnected from the reality of of uh parts of the population that cannot afford a car not not an ev a car period a new car even a nice car so so obviously there is that reality but if you want to think you know about the transition to a better uh, environment better quality air quality then we have to say what is the smartest thing to do in a place that wants to shift but the cars are still expensive well go for the biggest fleets in 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 i can give you many examples of, of companies that are switching because they tell you even if the van even if the car is more expensive in price once you add the, the operational cost and i do the numbers it's a good deal for us so you can demand you can create demand by doing that and and as i said before we have to keep in mind that the price the price parity is is closer than we imagined and the other thing is that at least in again you know in costa rica so that we we have a country that is not you know the us or is, is norway one thing that was very surprising is that the market for evs started with people that went to the us and got second hand nissan leaves so because the car dealers were not selling them and they were fed up of this they literally went so if you look at the ev association in costa rica that is very much modeled on the one in norway that critical mass those festivals where we had t-shirts that said i drive electric ask me anything or something like this in spanish those cars were from second hand uh second hand electric cars that, that were cheaper and to some degree that has also helped in in other markets because basically you you have in at least in in the countries that i track you have more models because you have people basically not waiting for the price parity to happen in their own market so one final point is that it's very important to have this pioneer showing driving you know talking to people because of two things first they they change the perception that the technology is something that is going to happen in the future so that's at the consumer level and politically even in a country like norway you i i you know i have seen people that were very friendly to oil that were okay with norway drilling the arctic and after they got their uv they are starting to question whether it is a good idea for Norway to be so oil dependent. So there is that second benefit with AV. You, you become, some of them become activists. So it's, it's actually quite powerful. That's great. Yeah. Dollar, Dan would yeah, one way I just want to jump in on the question of cost. I mean, the state of Massachusetts, we're at the end of every pipeline, right? Uh, we, we spend about $20 billion on fossil fuels every year. We produce exactly zero fossil fuels every year right so all the money that we're spending on fossil fuels is money that's leaving the state of massachusetts that to me is the the most critical cost that we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about building a stronger economy for for a stronger energy economy for for our state right um and then, and then I, th I think the other thing that we have to be you know really realistic about in, in one area that that i'm hoping um that that we can really grow uh as a, as a state in, in in our ev policies is for us to really take a pretty realistic and hard look at how much we can expect consumers to accept the additional costs associated with making the transition to evs um and and you know if we want to get into more middle class working class kinds of backgrounds you know 
what what is the the realistic level of subsidy? I don't think that our current twenty five hundred dollars is getting us into you know really people who who are below seventy five thousand dollars in income, for example. So you know what what is the amount of cost that that you know people are 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 going to be prepared to take on in order to be able able to make this transition happen? To me, those two are really important. And then obviously, in order to be able to provide funding for the incentives, we need to figure out you know, how we're raising that money. That's where programs like the Transportation and Climate Initiative start to come in. Um, so, you know, so so it's a complex question. And, and, and then to even get into the public transportation side of things, I mean, you know, we have a very old infrastructure here in Massachusetts in terms of our public transportation, the public bus depots, figuring out, you know, what, what it takes to, to be able to get these fleets to do it. Um, it's going to be a really big conversation, I think, in this state, and, and I think we're ultimately going to need to think about multiple funding streams being able to come together on the infrastructure, on the purchase price, on, on all of these different components. I was just going to add, I think these are all really good points. Just on the affordability of the vehicles, I think it's important to, to, to remember that these policies are about purchases of new vehicles starting with a certain date. So whether it's 2030, 2035, 2040, it's if you are buying a new vehicle. And so this, this policy does not change the fundamentals of car ownership. So typically in the US at least, um, most wealthier people buy new vehicles and the rest of us buy used vehicles. So literally um, only 18% of Americans can afford to pay cash for a new vehicle. Um, and so what this is not going to change that model at all. It just says that as of that date that where we reach 100%, all the automakers are having to compete for business. Um, and, and they're, you know, we're not even going to call them electric vehicles anymore. They'll just be called vehicles, right? And so they have to compete on price. They have to make models that people want. And as happens today, the people with more money will be buying the new ones. And the rest of us will be um, waiting, and you know, as we our cars wear out and we get a, another car, they'll they'll probably be a used. The vast majority of us, of us will get a used vehicle. What this policy does is accelerate when those used EVs will get into the market that the rest of us can afford. Um, so that's the upfront price, and then instantly, you know, with EVs, the the cost of the fuel is much cheaper. Um, on average across the US, it's half the cost of gasoline. In Washington state, it's a third. Um, and then the maintenance costs are about half of what they are for uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle with all those mechanical parts that can tend to fail. This is basically a battery on wheels and they have very low maintenance costs. That was a wonderfully comprehensive response to that basic bucket of questions that I threw at you. Um, there are more questions than we can <laughs> we can ask today um, and it's getting close to half past so I think I'll um, ask one more question before we return to our last two slides and that, that question is at the beginning we talked about sort of five goals and the, the last one was what else do we need to learn um, so I'd love to hear from each of you what is one question that you are still looking for an answer to or one thing that you think we all need to learn um, to help actually get this accelerated transition going so that we reach our goal by 2035. We can go in the same order. Go ahead, Monica. <laughs> yes. So one one lesson that I, I have observed here in Amsterdam that got me thinking about how to accelerate this in, in other in other cities, in other countries, is how to create a very robust ecosystem that has many stakeholders rooting for EVs and not just cars, but buses, trucks, you know, anything that has electricity and that gets us away from tailpipe pollution. And one observation is that, at least here, I see the mayor having this, this wonderful way of, 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 of bringing many stakeholders on board, not just with a mobility story or just with a climate story, which is very important because you know there is an existential crisis and we need to tackle it and, and we need to listen to the science. But not everybody will, will resonate with that, right? Like it's Thursday afternoon, it's 4 p.m., you're thinking about other things and maybe the story to hook you is different. And what I notice is that the story of, of a hub or a, or a pioneering city or a pioneering state that is going to be very much aligned with the future, is going to attract investments, is going to 
make investors want to deploy infrastructure is going to create jobs if, for example in europe there is a discussion a very active discussion about battery manufacturing so they they are saying you know it's not just about driving evs it's about driving evs that have a battery that was made in europe that would be very very good for us so so once you start it's, it's like throwing a, a, a stone in the lake right like you have one one circle and then you have another one and you have another one so when I go to EV conferences here, um, and then I just start talking to a lot of people who change jobs. You know, I have met people from oil and gas who change their jobs, and they I, they are working in 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 the EV space in infrastructure, for example. And then I just get into these conversations, and they saw the opportunity, and they said, "I want to stop what I'm doing. I want to be part of this." So this this one thing to be part of this, I think, is something we need to trigger in Massachusetts, in Washington, in, in other places to see how this catches fire, just for lack of a better word, maybe this is not the best word, but you know, to make it contagious, I think it's, it's critical. And yeah, that's what captures my imagination. Thank you. Janelle, do you wanna go ahead? Sure, yeah. So um, the question I think about a lot is, um, okay, so let's say we do this and everybody con converges around 2035 or 2040 or 2030, and so new cars are going to be electric after that date. We still need to do more in terms of cutting gasoline consumption. So the question I think about is how are we going to take gas burning vehicles that are grandfathered under this plan off the road? And how are we going to be strategic about getting the ones that travel the most miles and get and use the most gasoline basically um so that's that's the question that's on my mind you took mine janelle <laughs> um but uh let me extrapolate a little bit more on that yeah no i think one question i'm really thinking a lot about these days is how, how are we getting those high mileage drivers those 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 high use cases um you know i'm i'm, I'm living here in north cambridge um and around my neighborhood you know teslas are an increasingly common site right and that's great um but it's also cambridge and you know we, we really need to be getting these vehicles out in the communities where people absolutely have to drive an hour two hours you know to be able to 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 get their daily commute in um i think you know one thing that that we want to be thinking more clearly about and and that we're um talking about in the context of the transportation and climate initiative is how we can make these technologies work for rural drivers you know in rural communities we really don't have a lot of other kinds of clean transportation strategies that you know um that that we think are really going to reduce emissions significantly so you know thinking thinking about how we make them more relevant to rural communities hopefully the you know new round of electric pickup trucks can start to to help with that um, but but that's certainly on my mind. Um, you know, ride hailing is a use case that I'm really interested in exploring further, both because of this high mileage thing and because of just how, you know, the seeing it in the community factor and the getting to experience the ride for the first time, that those kinds of factors. Um, getting into those those kinds of use cases, maybe, you know, and 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 I think to some extent, you know, as we start thinking about kind of the future, um, particularly you know, if we're living in a context in which increasingly the absolute number of vehicle sales is going to be mandated, you know, by California regulations um, and hopefully by increased federal stringent, increasingly stringent federal regulations as well. Um, you know, as, as as we start moving in that into that future, I think more and more we're going to want to be thinking about how do we make sure that those vehicles end up in the hands of people who really need them. You know whether that's you know people who tend to be a little more low income or at least lower income than can currently afford the vehicles um or or the really high mileage drivers um to, to to make sure that we're really maximizing the benefits well thank you we will we'll keep thinking about all of those big open questions with you um and we wanted to extend a, a very very grateful thank you for uh, sharing 90 minutes of your day with us um, to talk about this important topic. I have two closing slides and I think Larry's coming back. Um, so I'll share my screen. So for those of you who are all fired up now about phasing out gas powered cars and, and want to know what you can do, we have two sort of next steps um, for you. One is to go to our website on the link on the slide um, and pledge that your next car will be electric. Our, our Drive Green program is there for you if you need a new car right now, new or used car. 
Um, but we recognize that not everybody is on the market for a car right now. But if you sign our pledge, we'll keep you posted on um, developments in the EV market, in policy stuff in Massachusetts, so that you can just stay informed with a friendly little newsletter from us and know what cars are coming out and what your options are. And then if you are also particularly interested in working on the structural side of this, doing some advocacy work, um, if you subscribe to our blog, um, you'll stay up to date on opportunities to engage both in um, the clean energy and climate plan that Dan mentioned, the bill that Rep Moschino filed, and what other opportunities uh, come up that get at this really thorny issue. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back to Larry. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, First of all, Monica, uh, Janelle, uh, Dan, and, and of course our own Anna, uh, thank you so much. I had really high expectations for today's webinar and, and you certainly met those and, and, and surpassed them. But um, looking at the backgrounds of everybody, please follow Monica. Um, I follow her on Twitter, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Janelle at uh, Cultura, uh, doing great work on the West Coast. And, and Dan is just a great public servant. We're so lucky to have him working for us in Massachusetts. Um, so we will send out uh, an email with links to information and the recording to this and the slides. I hope you all enjoyed this. Um, starting today and through the end of March, actually, if you were to go to our website, greenenergyconsumers.org backslash give now, um, we have a generous uh, donor who is willing to match your donation. Um, and you can get information about that um, we're very fortunate, um, and, and here, look at the picture. Um, what's doubled is, is this, this uh, extended family bought two Nissan Leafs through our Drive Green program, and, and so we, we think they're a great uh, example of, of where we're going with this. We have to move faster, and today I think we learned how to do that. So thanks very much, and, and have a great day.